Hi there, my name is Mr. Lehman, and chances are that if you're watching this, you're interested in video game design and also lesson plans for education, which I get is a weird Venn diagram of crossover interests, but hey, you're here, and I'm here, and let's talk about my seven rules of engagement to keep people invested. I've been teaching for over 20 years, and I've been playing video games since I was six, so by all means, let's get into it. Number one, be overt about what's happening. People like to know what they're getting into. This applies to kids in a classroom and people at a gaming table. The second someone starts going, what are we doing? Then you've already lost them. By all means, have mystery, have intrigue, that stuff is fun, but you don't want people mired in confusion. I know there's this pushback in education where a lot of teachers feel that they're forced to list their objectives on the board, but honestly, it's good for the kids to know what they're supposed to be doing and where they're supposed to be going. Let's say I'm teaching history and the objective for the day is, by the end of this class, you will be able to list the three branches of the US government. Great, as a teacher that keeps me on track so that I don't go off on some kind of weird tangent about the time I went to Woodstock 94 and it lets the students know, what exactly are we doing? If you just say, oh, this is a history class, we're learning history, that doesn't really narrow it down. People like to know what they're supposed to be paying attention to, and then they can pay attention to it. By the end of this video, you'll be able to describe three of my rules for engagement. A game that does this sort of overt storytelling well is Dragon Quest I, or Dragon Warrior I if you lived in the United States and you're as old as I am. The game starts with the king just flat out telling you that, hey, there's this bad guy called the Dragon Lord, and he's already won. So that's why there's monsters everywhere. Can you go defeat the Dragon Lord so monsters stop running around? Cool. So by the end of this game, I'll have defeated the Dragon Lord. Well, actually, you can also side with the Dragon Lord in that game, but it will at least still end the game. When you defeat the Dragon Lord, all the monsters go away. Yay! Huzzah! An ending that me, the player, contributed to. This sort of upfront overt storytelling is also helpful in Dungeons and Dragons. I've played in a fair number of games that really feel more like Skyrim. And a big part of Skyrim is, oh, the world is so enchanting. and Oh, I can kind of go off from the main quest and kind of just diddle around and mix some potions together. And oh, fiddly D isn't that fun, which is great, but you're kind of forgetting what the goal is. And quite honestly, Skyrim is a single player game where you have the freedom to just go meander around, but it also doesn't really interfere with the other players because there aren't any, it's just you. But that's why Skyrim is a single player game. The Fallout series also follows this kind of meandering structure where there's a main story quest line and you're kind of free to explore it at your own pace. See if you can spot the one where it's a group game and you're not really given any direction. Yeah, it's not the popular one. Many times these meandering games, I will play them while I'm watching something else. So it's not really taking my full attention. If I'm playing a multiplayer game, it should engage my attention and my friends should be there to support me. But if it's not doing that, it'll get review scores like this. Yikes. Oh, how did Fallout 76 sell? Poorly. Now you're making less money as a business because you're not overt about what the players are even supposed to be doing and you want the players to enjoy a multiplayer experience. Mm. Being overt at your Dungeons & Dragons table or in your classroom is vital for retaining someone's engagement. A common complaint about Dungeons & Dragons is player retention. People going, oh yeah, I'll play with you, and then just sort of dropping off and then the campaign doesn't finish. In terms of a classroom, if they're not engaged, they can't just leave, they're just going to be disruptive. Be overt and be clear about the direction they're supposed to be going, and they can have little fun side trips along the way, but they'll at least know that they have a destination that they're reaching towards. Number two, no excessive over-explaining or lore dumping. Look, I get it. Some people are very, very passionate about very niche subjects. Cool. Awesome. But in storytelling, you are telling a story to people. You're not saying a story at people. Once a student starts asking, is any of this on the test? Or when people start looking for the skip cutscene button in real life, that's a pretty good sign that you should either refocus back onto the main path of the storyline, or you should just wrap it up. 
The first written law code is this thing called the Code of Hammurabi. It's 282 laws. Those laws are more or less fair if you are doing crimes against people in the same class. But crimes against people above you in class or crimes against people below you in class carry different kinds of penalties. Do our laws in the United States follow the same system or are we more of a classless society? Think pair share with your neighbor after completing this worksheet and we will discuss it together as a class. Notice how I'm not just going to read the Wikipedia at them because, yikes, it is full of all kinds of data that I don't need. Notice how I'm also not going on some weird tangent about the military or about metalworking or something like that. Yeah, they don't need to know all that right now. We're just talking about law codes and how they are different depending on people's class. Bottom line, you don't teach people a good lesson by overloading them with a lot of data. The Mega Man games do this really well. I mean, the first game doesn't even make it clear as to what you're even supposed to be doing because there isn't any text. Cut Man? Guts Man? Are those characters I'm selecting? No. You learn that, hey, those robots are bad. If you kill those robots, then you're able to use their robot powers to do even more robotic mayhem against more evil robots. Well, off you go. The game is teaching you that killing evil robots, taking their robot powers, and using them to efficiently kill other robots is awesome and fun. And you learn how those weapons work through gameplay, not a giant wall of text. Oh gee, what's this, later Mega Man games? A giant wall of text and or narration describing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, even though I was literally already doing it? Cool. Oh, and you called me stupid too. That's awesome. This goes on for another 15 seconds, and then a giant monster shows up that I was just told was gonna show up. What's going on? Whatever happened to this? That's why the Mega Man games they make today look like their 80s versions, because they're simple and fun and you can just pick up and play. Your D&D players do not need and they do not want you to read a three paragraph essay at them about what kind of masonry tools were used in the brickwork of this building as opposed to the building Why that's on the, are you doing the street. This to me? Now, I'm aware that that building on the other side of the street was installed by the Rithgard Pavarians and they originally, according to the Prophetess's scripture, had a lot of different kinds of trolls and hammers so that they could chisel rocks out of the horn. Ooh, what? No, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, is this on the test? If you overload people with this kind of data all the time, they're just going to feel really lost, whether it's at your gaming table or it's in your classroom. Number three, covert learning, background storytelling. My eighth grade history students do this big pirate project. You can see some of the posters there behind me. Part of this assignment is tell me about your pirate in under two minutes, and they have to write a two-page paper on their pirate, and it's all part of their grade. It is not possible to read a two-page paper in two minutes, or at least be coherent about it. So they start to freak out. Oh my gosh, I have to memorize all this. Do I have to write a separate speech? Can I do a... Yeah, stop, stop, stop. There's no speech. There's no teleprompter. There's no note cards. There's none of that. You just are telling us about your super cool pirate for two minutes. I don't need you to memorize a bunch of meaningless detail. In fact, the last section said, do not give us a bunch of meaningless detail. Just tell us why this pirate is cool. This is like telling me about your favorite movie. Just tell me what you like about the movie. I don't need to hear about the cast list or how long the movie is or what kind of aspect ratio certain scenes were filmed in. Just tell me why you think the movie's cool. For them, it's usually a little bit of a struggle, but they get through it and they learn two covert lessons. One, confidence and presentation make something fun. Having someone read data at you that's just a bunch of dates and places is boring and nobody likes it. They also learn that 80% of their pirates all know each other, and a lot of them got together and made this thing called the Pirate Code, which is a list of laws and rules that the pirates vote on. It's one of the first examples of a collaborative democracy made by Europeans in the New World. That's a fun way for them to learn something. I could just tell them, but this feels a little better. Doom 2016 is a game about you shooting demons from hell on Mars. Very early on in the game, someone tries to explain the plot to you, and this happens. Welcome. I'm Dr. Samuel Hayden. I'm the head of this facility. I think we can work together and resolve this problem in a way that benefits us both. That is some good covert storytelling. It's telling me that the character I'm playing 
doesn't really care about the lore, so I probably don't have to. And we both just want to get back to shooting demons. The game will absolutely let you poke around in the backstory and in the lore, but it's not going to interrupt gameplay to do that, and it's telling me that through gameplay. A more recent example of covert learning that I really liked was from the game Unpacking. In this game, you're just unpacking stuff and putting it away in various spaces throughout your life. At one point, you move in with a partner, and their stuff needs to be organized a little better to make room for you in their apartment. And I was blown away when I learned that there was nowhere to hang my diploma, and the only place I could put it was under the bed next to my yoga mat. Yikes. They learned from the gameplay that this relationship was not going to work. And the very next chapter, your character moves home as an adult. Because of the breakup with your ex, when you put the photos on the bulletin board, you put a thumbtack right through your ex's face. I didn't need that explained at me. It felt nice for me to learn that on my own. Covert learning. In Dungeons & Dragons, covert learning can take a lot of forms. I think one of my favorite examples is from a game I was running when the party kept finding these incriminating notes. But then one of the players realized, oh, wait a minute. We have different notes in different handwriting from different people, but all these incriminating notes kind of have the same handwriting, so maybe the same person wrote all of these really suspicious notes. So now those notes are becoming evidence and like a paper trail of crimes. It's also like their character didn't discover it. They, as people, chose to put the work in. They figured it out. Work worth doing feels rewarding. It can be subtle, but it can still be there. You might not have noticed it. But your brain did. Number four, creating a move set. What can I do on my turn? A move set is options that we're doing in a space or time. Am I painting a still life? Am I taking notes about science? Am I drawing cards in a game? Am I jumping over hurdles? Am I jumping over turtles? I see this a lot in education and in gaming. And confusion over this question of what can I do on my turn stalls both. While I'm a big fan of people learning through experimentation and discovery, to get into a lesson or a game, people need to know the basics of the space and the move set that they can choose from. In my classroom, they have a clear move set. Raise your hand and wait to be called on. Take notes. Complete the exit ticket. Okay. Scream your head off is not on the move set. Neither is throw a baseball. One game that does this moveset very well is Final Fantasy II, a.k.a. Final Fantasy IV. Early in the game, the main character only has two moves, fight and item, and that's it. But as you, the player, move through the game and you gain more skills and you gain more aptitude at the game itself, your moveset expands to reflect your growth. Those first few days of school, I am not expecting my students to make some big giant weird project about pirates. But as the school year progresses, they gain some more skills and their skill set move list might expand a little bit. Many games evolve and change like this in terms of a move set. You start with a starter deck of cards and maybe you add more to them, or the game increases in complexity as it moves forward. Uh, even games I don't like do this. Yeah, Monopoly, I'm talking about you. In Dungeons & Dragons, you usually begin with some kind of starting kit of items and gear and moves. And as the game progresses, you will expand upon this. But it's also helpful to be overt about what your player's character is going to be doing further along in the story. Is your character a bard? Are they going to be talking a whole bunch? Are they going to be using a lot of skills? Or are they like Cecil up here, just a fighter with fight and item? Number five vertical and horizontal progression. These are a little complicated, so I'm just going to be overt and define them right out of the gate. Vertical progression measures the raw power of the numbers of the challenge I'm throwing at you. The more growth you experience, the stronger you become at something, and so you need more of a challenge to push up against. Horizontal progression is the ability to approach tasks in new ways. It's adding abilities and techniques to your moveset so you have more options when facing more challenging problems. In education and in gaming, both vertical and horizontal progression are a path to success. Vertical progression in gaming is easy to see. It's when I hit a monster, the numbers are bigger now than they were at the beginning of the game. Again, in Final Fantasy IV, you're hitting a monster like this 
and at the end, you're hitting a monster like this. Vertical progression by itself is not always enjoyable. If I'm hitting lower number monsters with a lower number at the beginning of the game and higher number monsters with a higher number at the end of the game, the numbers have gone up, but the difficulty hasn't really changed a lot or the variety of gameplay has stayed rather stagnant. Vertical progression in education usually takes the form of, oh, I was asking you to complete five math problems, and now I'm asking you to complete 10 math problems. Or maybe I'm testing you on addition, and your early addition math problems look like this, but now your later edition math problems, which are still using addition, look like this. The numbers literally went up. Vertical progression in education does not look like this. Oh, I've got this multiple choice question and it has four options. What if I made this multiple choice question have 10 options? I mean, I made the number go bigger, so it must be more difficult. No, it's just more annoying. Don't do it like that. In education, horizontal progression should take the form of asking questions in different kinds of ways. Just multiple choice might not get you the data that you want. You might want true false you might want matching you might want short answer you might want a big chunky essay where they can get really deep into a question to give you better data to better assess where their skill level is horizontal progression is very common in gaming oh my character learned a new spell oh my character can double jump and it allows your character to approach challenging problems in new kinds of ways that might make those challenges a little bit easier to overcome it's not just oh the numbers got bigger in Dungeons & Dragons, please integrate both vertical and horizontal progression. I don't just want to be hitting monsters all day. I want to have new ways to solve intricate problems. I also want those monsters to fight back in new and interesting and creative ways. Variety is fun. Number six, create causal relationships between concepts. No more and then and then and then. I usually teach history and there's a reason why students don't like history and quite frankly, I didn't like history, and you probably didn't like history when you were in school either. You always had to memorize some kind of giant, massive list. Oh, it's the 50 states and all their capitals. Oh, it's all of the presidents. Oh, it's all of the signers of the Constitution. All that memorizing nonsense just goes in one ear and right out the other, leaving no lasting impact. List the 50 states and their capitals. Uh, really? It's 2024 and maps exist. If you only teach memorization, then that's how the kids are going to approach every single problem. I get so many math students that try to memorize all of math rather than understand how to do a mathematical operation. Not only are the students memorizing a whole bunch of lists, they're memorizing a bunch of lists that aren't even connected to each other. Here's a list of all the 50 states and their capitals, and a list of all the presidents, and a list of all the amendments, and a list of all the signers of the Constitution, and who cares? It's just something you could look up. They're not particularly connected to each other. Why are you learning it? it this doesn't make any sense, and it's not going to stick. No, and then! Connect their ideas together around their learning. Get away from this, and then, and then, and then stuff, and start getting on board with thus, but. Here's how I use that concept in a lesson. Okay, prior to the U.S. Civil War, and one of the main causes of it, was that the South wanted slavery to remain legal in the U.S. Constitution. But as the U.S. is expanding, the geography of the U.S., Canada, and Mexico means that the North will have more land and will eventually outlaw slavery by making more northern states. Thus, the South causes a war with Mexico, thus allowing the southern states to spread slavery into Mexican land. But the northern states still had a slight majority in the Senate and stopped paying for the Mexican-American War, thus causing a troop removal from Mexico because the army wasn't getting paid, causing no new slave states to be created. But the South still wanted slavery. That is a much more engaging way to tell a story. There's twists, there's turns, there's agency, there's this causality flow that I can follow. It's a lot more exciting. You're going down this rapid river and you're not just standing in a tepid puddle. Good game design should not rely on making a giant list, though I will admit that the most valuable intellectual property is Pokemon, and that is essentially making a giant list, but there's a little more to it than that. Who's that Pokemon? It's Additional competent gameplay elements. You're exploring, you're having a little bit of combat, there's both vertical and horizontal progression. Awesome. 
The moves are extremely clear. The plot is not overly explained, and it is also overtly explained. The goal is right in the opener. I wanna be the very best. Okay, that sounds like fun. Off you go. Players want characters who struggle, grow, and change. That's an arc. That's a major part of a plot. Now, granted, you can give us a plot twist where something unexpected happens that's out of our control, but if your plot twist is a plot list of just stuff that happens at me, regardless of any decision I make, then it's not really a game, and it's not really a story, and I'm not really going to finish it. Because I'm not going to care. I have an example of this from a Dungeons & Dragons session that I ran with my students. A player learned that he could use sleight of hand to steal objects from people. And he stole this amulet from a mage, thus learning that the mage can't use magic without an amulet. He thought, hey, maybe I can steal all kinds of stuff. The party was talking with an NPC quest giver who said, hey, I've got a super cool quest for you, but let me give you this device. It's in my backpack. And the player went, oh, I'm going to steal that device out of their backpack. He rolled an 18, and so I gave him this. Alvin's invention, you have no idea what it does. So here's Alvin, digging around through his backpack, trying to find this device so he can give you the device, teach you how to use it, and then give you the quest. But the player already has the device, but they have no idea how it works. Thus, the player learned, oh, I should probably put this back in Alvin's backpack. So he tried to put it back, but he rolled a two on his sleight of hand check, thus dropping the device on the floor. Alvin sees that these people are a bunch of skeezy thieves, Thus, does not want to work with them anymore for the rest of the entire game. So I just took the binder and all the pages and just turned it over and went, okay, now what would you like to do? Meaningful consequences based on their actions that they chose to take. Now, if that mage had said, oh, you stole my magical amulet, which allows me to cast spells. It's a good thing I had this other magical amulet for reasons. Or if Alvin went, oh, I don't mind that you're stealing from me, you skeezy weirdos. By all means, here's how you use my invention. Please go rescue my friend because you're super trustworthy. Yeah, they wouldn't feel like they have any impact on the story, and they wouldn't feel like the story would matter. And then I'm doing my job as a storyteller very poorly if events just happen because they do. It's just a bunch of stuff that happened. Just like memorizing a list, it doesn't matter. I don't want to learn that way. I don't want to play that way. And quite frankly, I don't even want to teach that way. Number seven, have a conclusion. <gasps> Good lessons have a wrap up, a conclusion where we reflect on what we learned. It should also build to something. It should feel like it's getting close to an ending. Students, people need that time to reflect on that information it's they just learned. Uh... Don't just go all the way to the bell and have the bell ring and go, okay, off you go. I see that in movies and TV all the time. There's not like a wrap up to what you just learned. The bell rings and the class just stops. Dr. Jones, you're the reason I got into history, but buddy, that is not how you end a class. Same thing with a game. It needs a plot because plots end. Sure, you can let the players explore around in the game world and kind of putter about, but honestly, you're gonna want some kind of an arc. Skyrim is a good example of this. There's rich lore, there is gorgeous scenery, you're the main character, the world feels lived in, yet there is an end state. Still, it's got those like radiant quests that really never end. You're not going to endlessly go into every single cave and fight the same undead monsters over and over and over again and do that weird puzzle where there's like a rock with a whale on it. Like, yeah, that's going to get stale. It's going to become repetitive. It's going to feel like a list. In fact, as I'm sitting here talking about Skyrim, I kind of forget what the plot was because there were too many radiant quests of just repetitive meandering that caused me to kind of forget the ending of that game. I think you fight a big dragon on a mountain. A good story ends. It doesn't just stop. Endings feel conclusive and they feel satisfying and they reinforce the impact that you, the player, had on the story. If you're telling a good story and giving a good lesson, provide a good ending. It'll feel conclusive. It'll feel like the people who you've involved in your storytelling had some kind of impact on either their own learning or even their own just adventure. Speaking of an end state, this feels like a good place to wrap it up. At the beginning of this video, I said that you'd be able to name three of my seven 
rules for engagement in terms of storytelling and lesson planning. Can you maybe do that down in the comments? Just pick the three you like. If you've got more ideas about how we can enrich our storytelling and our lesson planning, by all means, share them down in the comments. And hey, maybe I'll make a part two. In either case, I hope you have a super awesome cool day. Take it easy. Bye.